बाद हेलो एवरीवन थैंक्स फॉर बीइंग हियर टुनाइट आल्सो टू ऑल ऑफ यू वाचिंग दिस एल्सवेयर we have so far hosted our events online but tonight's conversation is being hosted by the white box art center the first collaboration of fixing the future with another organization fdf is a new york based collective consisted of myself diane bauer joshua johnson sohail malik and keith tilford we would like to think of our events as a platform for thinking rigorously about the future to loosely quote our statement of purpose from fixingthefuture.info if our broad concern will be how political and economic transformations of society as a whole can now be credibly conceived and organized our particular issue will be how this reimagining and practical theoretical repurposing can be culturally instantiated we ask whether art redetermination away from the indeterminate contemporary art can enable it to become a productive way for making the future i am going to open tonight's talk with two disclaimers about what this event is not or perhaps at best should not be about First, we are not here to assess the Israel's war on Palestine from a local perspective, i.e., who did what, when, and how. Nor are we here to act as a moral metric or an ethical compass for the ongoing war. We are also not here to blame parties or to further sensationalize something that already has been obviously registered for a wide spectrum of opinions as outrageous. I think the frame I'm deploying tonight is already controversial enough. We are dealing with a New York exhibition of Arab and Palestinian art whose explosive charge could only be activated through a bizarre coincidental overlapping of cultural and military schedules here and elsewhere. And second, we are also not here to perform a classic historical overview of the problem from a localist perspective meaning we will not try to delve past of palestine and its various so called resistant ideologies or the past of israel and zionism we will not generalize using terms like the culture of colonial conquest a favorite topic of the cultural left or delve into the right wing obsession with the islamic culture of sacrifice nor will we reenact the theater of surprise when dealing with a worldwide com complicity in this latest round of barbarism we will not pretend we are disappointed by the american or european response to the crisis we will not pretend to be shocked at the arab nation states for their silence and inaction so what are we doing here then this event has more to do with the emergence of palestinian contemporary art and its current celebration here in new york than with the ongoing war elsewhere in the middle east in fact i decided to organize tonight's event after visiting the here and elsewhere exhibition at the new museum which as our press release reads uncannily coincides with the escalation of israel's ongoing war on gaza and the west bank after looking at works of art by palestinian artists in the show and hearing the news of the cancellation by israeli authorities of the planned trip to the city by Khaled Jarrah i thought it would be a good idea to think about the future of art in the context of palestine khaled is one of the artists in the new museum show he is also with us here tonight whose work is also the focus of a solo exhibition here at the white box gallery or white box actually art center curated by miriam while organizing this event i thought how pertinent it is how pertinent it would be to the coincidence of water and art to revisit benjamin's famous passage 
from the thesis on the philosophy of history, the number seven, in which he talks about the overlapping of the categories of civilization and barbarism in the very materiality of monuments and documents. You might know this already. The particular thesis I'm quoting has to do with Benjamin's contrasting of historicism versus historical materialism. Maybe the best thing will be to read a long section of this thesis to better grasp what is at stake at tonight's discussion. With whom, now I'm reading Benjamin, with whom the adherents of historicism actually em em empathize? The answer is inevitable, with a victor. And all rulers are the heirs of those who conquered before them. Hence, empathy with the victor invariably benefits the rulers. Historical materialists know what that means. Whoever has emerged victorious participates to this day in the triumphal procession in which the present rulers step over those who are lying prostrate. According to traditional practice, the spoils are carried along in the procession. They are called cultural treasures. And a historical materialist view and a historical materialist views them with cautious detachment. For without exception, the cultural treasures he surveys have an origin which cannot contemplate without horror. They owe their existence not only to the efforts of the great minds and talents who have created them, but also to the anonymous toil of their contemporaries. There is no document of civilization which is not at the same time a document of barbarism. And such and just as much a document is not free of barbarism. Barbarism taints also the manner in which it was transmitted from one owner to another. A historical materialist, therefore, disassociates himself from it as far as possible. He regards it as his task to brush history against the grain. So that's sort of like was my theoretical frame for tonight's discussion. And I hope the participants and respondents online can somehow Keep that in mind. I also have like, the, the, the bad news about tonight was that Ariella, for some reason, could not join us. But I was able to ask Khaled to join us, who wasn't supposed to join us. So, so, so bad news and good news. So this is what what we have. And the rest of the people, I'm going to go through the list when we get to, to introduce them. I'm just going to continue on reading my statement. By understanding the art war nexus in the 21st century, is in a desperate need. So this is what I'm, what I'm arguing, that understanding the art, art and war nexus in the 21st century is in a desperate need of a new form of historical materialism. One that in addition to the careful consideration of the relevance of the past to the present is also aware of the future's traction on the unfolding of the contemporary moment. A historical materialism whose new angel is not a painting and perhaps is another kind of a machine not just obsessed with the ruins of the past, but those of today and tomorrow. I was thinking about uh, Khaled's piece in the show, this kind of like machinic remembrance of all the names which has been playing here for a week now, right? Which I thought was a fitting to like sort of like a replacement for Benjaminian's Angelus Novus, where like I entered the room and it was just very like cold-blooded, was like reading all the name of pe names of people who have been killed in Gaza. If I'm, if, I'm, if I'm right. A historical materialism that once and for all recognizes history as the search for the past and present to find the future. There is also a more contemporary and strictly art historical frame for tonight's discussion, which has the entanglement of culture and the geopolitics of Cold War at its crosshair. An example that, if it was read against this new philosophy of history I'm proposing tonight, actually should have and could have indicated how all global art after the Cold War would always be entangled closely with geopolitics. Here I'm referring to the now classic volume by my former professor, Serge Gibault, How New York Stole the Idea of Modern Art, in which he recounts the story of the American state and capital's role in the ascendance of both New York and abstract expressionism to the cultural center of the West right after the World War II. Serge's book is obviously a document about the political essence of art, but perhaps also a case study for a more radical proposition that I'd like to make, that all art, due to the social nature of its production and distribution, should be considered as politics 
par excellence. The future use of this historical study then allows us to wade through what is presented by New Museum, not in terms of the organizers' various claims about the introduction of new forms and aesthetics to the global art dialogue and etc., but in regards to the political economy of global contemporary art from the Middle East, as reflected in the exhibition's funding by privately owned Middle Eastern postal services as well as super wealthy patrons of art who own global waste management companies, multinational high fashion retail chains, and luxury airlines. But it is not really sufficient to foreclose on the new museum's exhibition solely based on its financial support structure, since the problem we face goes far beyond the familiar theme of art as a financial instrument and the use of museum exhibitions for helping to guarantee art prices and careers in the future for artists. If that was the case, a follow-up to Serge's book would be called How Bloody Petrodollars Shape the Structures of Contemporary Art Here and Elsewhere. So let's return to the show itself. If the new museum's polite and neutral presentation of materials, meaning the artworks and the archives from the Arab world, are the body of the exhibit, I'd like to suggest that the anti-colonial resistance from the region in the past and the Palestinian resistance in the present provides the show with its quiet but haunting specter or soul. I say quiet because you wouldn't notice this living soul if you only read the wall text or study the exhibition's accompanying text. Here, I should add that there could be an exception made about this point. The Bidun intervention in the catalog, which has been printed purposefully on yellow color, yellow colored paper, is a decent departure from the museum's bland narrative. It provides the readers the closest thing to a rigorous understanding of art production and circulation from the Middle East. Yet even this intervention fails, since it cannot go beyond its own ready-made critique of the political economy of art and images, and does not dare to directly address geopolitics from the position of art. It, not, it does not engage in the challenge of distinguishing the anti-colonial from the post-colonial using the objective metrics of decolonization. It is very rare, if at all possible, to find in the show or the catalog an attempt to dislocate the Arab question from its multiple disjointed localities and simultaneously uniting and connecting them with what has been going on on a planetary scale. From a temporal perspective, the show provides us plenty of local details about the past and sometimes the present, only in order to inform us about particular ideas, moments, or events. Overall, besides a few exceptions, the show, not as a collection of individual great works, but itself as a unified entity, like how Daniel Boran talked about exhibitions being themselves a piece of art, fails to transcend the limitations of contemporary art as set by thinkers such as Sohail Malik and his identification of contemporary art's indeterminacy, or Peter Osborne's rebuttal of contemporary art's claim to contemporaneity, and Sinead Murphy's problematizations of art's obsession with its own evolving but self-declared definitions. Overall, and in light of the current conflict, contemporary art, even if supplied from a region which has been experiencing decades of both conventional and civil wars, guerrilla urban warfare, and recently revolutions and coup d'etats, still fails to sufficiently account for the politics proper, or how art can potentially be reconfigured to anticipate and make a future. If, for the existing Western left, the future has already been canceled, and the end of history has forever ruined the possibility of a break out of a short loop known as the present. For new liberalism, securing of the future means opening up spaces through taking and managing risks, moving faster and ushering new epochs through synthesizing detailed plans with unknown contingencies as a means of getting attraction on a desired future. And this is what we desperately are in a need of. This is why perhaps the 21st century, as we live it today, quite abruptly began with the surprising conquest of the rest of Palestine by Israeli army on the Six Day War and on June 10, 1967. A year that even philosopher Elizabeth Kassab has already referred to in one of the yellow pages of the catalog, actually the last page, as the turning point in the history of the region. An event which meant so many things at the same time. 
among which we can count the beginning of the end of Arab secular nationalism as the dominant anti-colonial force in the region, and the slow but steady rise of political Islam as its so-called alternative. 1967 war was also the basis for Khomeini's famous lectures in Iraq in 1969, providing a blueprint for the clergy's governance in Iran after the revolution. According to this reactionary future philosopher king of Iran, this is, I'm quoting Khomeini now, if the rulers of the Muslim countries truly represented the believers and enacted God's ordinance, they would set aside their pretty differences, abandon their subservience and divisive activities, and join together like the fingers of one hand. Then a handful of Jews, the agents of America, Britain, and other foreign powers, would have never been able to accomplish what they have, no matter how much support they enjoyed from America and Britain." Unquote. The 1967 war also meant the expulsion of PLO from the West Bank and Gaza and the migration of refugees into neighboring countries, whose short and long-term devastating effects were the Black September mass massacre in Jordan, implemented by the future dictator of Pakistan, who later on played a crucial role in coordinating the Saudi-US-backed project of the weaponization of Islam through arming and supporting the Afghan Mujahideen against the Soviets, and also the civil war in Lebanon, which brought us the first 21st century proxy war in the Middle East, combined with car bombs and other urban warfare techniques and tactics. These events were followed by other regional conflicts and wars, each more brutal and barbaric, as well as innovative and effective in their aims than the one before, namely the Iran-Iraq War, the Gulf War, the Yugoslavia Civil War, as well as the Chechen War, which together caused the awakening of the Russian nationalism in the KGB and the KGB's response to the NATO threat with Putin. These conflicts were all fought along the, lines of, along the lines originating in Cold War, but slowly spiraled out of control into the future chaos we now call 21st century. So we are here now. Israel is supported by the global new liberal north, but also by Arab monarchies of Saudi and UAE, who also, we know, have been very enthusiastic in investing and promoting contemporary art from the region. On the other side, we have Turkey and Qatar, two other contemporary art-loving nation states, who are from the one side, friends and allies of the global neoliberal north, and from the other, the go-between, if not allies of Taliban, Muslim Brotherhood, and Hamas. They have been in a competition with Saudi Egypt access for regional influence, but this does not stop them from working hand-in-hand -hand with Qatar and Turkey against the Shia in Iraq and Iran, funding and supporting ISIL which now is in charge of half of Iraq. Let's go further. We now have neo-Nazis in Europe who support Israel, among, among them Mary Le Pen, the president of the French National Front, and other even more extreme figures who identify Israel with wealth and power and see Muslims in Europe as a common enemy. So the question can't really be whether we should or should not focus on Israel-Palestine conflict, but how to place this very old local problem that links the 20th century's Cold War geopolitics to today's flurry of new planetary developments. In a short piece commissioned for Le Mans in 1977, Deleuze, ex Deleuze expresses his fears about the future of the world by stating, today Israel is conducting an experiment. It has invented a model of repression that, once adapted, will profit other countries. Does this allow us to ask if Israel's method of suppressing Palestinians is still a worrying model of the future of the world? To quote from a lesser known work by an almost forgotten political thinker, Guy Debord, in the comments on the Society of the Spectacle, he makes a statement about liberal democratic governments that, for better or for worse, still resonate strongly in the geopolitical manifest image of the 21st century. This supposed reality that was introduced to the Western culture in the second half of the 20th century by Israeli political discourse, as predicted by Deleuze in 1977, was of course generalized, if not also globalized, by the new liberal North after the September 11 attacks. These days, even enemies of America, namely Iran and Russia, have conveniently adopted this category to define their ultimate enemies. I am talking here about terror and terrorism. The board writes, the perfect democracy fabricate its own incon sorry, inconceivable enemy, terrorism. 
it wants actually to be judged by its enemies rather than by its own results. The history of terrorism is written by the state and it is thus instructive. The spectating population must certainly never know everything about terrorism, but they must always know enough to convince them that, compared with terrorism, everything else, including the destruction of a city in about three weeks, seems rather acceptable. In any case, more rational and democratic. Now, the spectrum, the contemporary Catholic and quite to the right of liberal norm philosopher of science, Bruno Latour, defines quite perversely the Eurocentric unfolding of both the 21st century and the bloody process of globalization as that of the competition by the West with the rest for remaining relevant. He writes, after having registered the sudden new weakness of the former West and trying to imagine how it could survive for a bit longer in the future to maintain its place in the sun, we have to establish connections with the others that cannot possibly be held in the nature society collectors. Or to use another ambiguous term, we just might have to engage in cosmopolitics. My question is, could it be possible that fighting the other as terrorists by destroying their cities, think about Fallujah, homes in Syria, before you think about Gaza actually, while celebrating the culture in our own cities, the very precise practice of the Laturian cosmopolitics. And to revisit Benjamin's passage at the end, is cosmopolitics a mixing of the Benjaminian barbarism with an empathy of the victor actually with the victim, not just with the culture of the victor. My final point would be precisely about the temporal feature of this seemingly unrelated but nevertheless simultaneous operation at the museum and at the war front. If in the past a delay separated the exercise of barbarism from the celebration of the spoils of the war as treasures, think of how long it took Europe to actually begin to take up the Holocaust culturally. If up until now the conqueror had to wait for the annihilation of the enemies in order to consider them as civilized people capable of producing art and culture, in today's complex and networked world, the delay is removed and the killing and celebration can take place simultaneously. So thank you for listening to my presentation. I provided this as sort of a framework for tonight's discussion and I would like to um, go live and maybe get Khaled to see what Khaled wants to contribute as the first guest after me. Khaled, are you ready? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. And uh, <clears throat> you know that I, I, it was short notice to the invitation, so I don't have so much to say. You hear me well? Okay. We can hear you, yeah. Just try to speak yeah. a little bit like slower. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because there's like compression going on. Okay. So for these days I would like really to remember the victims of Gaza and to to say that um, the, the, the media, the international, is really don't, you know, taking any kind, you know, uh, true position to, to, to tell the story about what's happening. And they are uh, either taking a side for Israel or not mentioning the victims of Gaza and there was many stories about journalists who was just witnessing the truth in Gaza and their uh, media was kicking, kicking them out from Gaza because they just say the truth or they just like uh, show their anger about the, the fascist and uh, the massive massacres that happening in Gaza. 
And uh, of course, here in the West Bank, we uh, we really feel depressed and so angry that we can't do anything. It's 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 huge, and uh, and what's happened for us here, we can't even compare it. We can't even talk about it. So I see that the new Nazi now in Israel is became very fashionable and uh, Israeli succeed to uh, to promote this war as war between Israel as a country and and Hamas as a tourist tourist uh, tourism uh, organization but actually Israel was bombing uh, the people, bombing the kids, bombing the houses on the head of the people in Gaza. And uh, that's my, yani, my, just my words to, to the victims of Gaza and to the people who's living now in the streets. Since there is no secure place, Yani UNRWA, the United Nations, the Red Cross, all these human rights institutions in Gaza, they were not answering the phones, the phone calls by the people. When the people was asking them, where is the good and safe place to go? And they were not answering them. And when they found them in the street to ask them, they said there's no place is in Gaza is safe. They were taking them to the schools, to the UNRWA schools, to the United Nations schools. And when they put them there, the Israeli, they bombed them. Here in the West Bank, there was many demonstrations and clashes. A group of people gather together with, with big demo and go to the to the checkpoints at the entrance of the cities and try to do something, show their anger by throwing stones. And uh, I was attending, as a photographer, I was attending one uh, big, the biggest demonstration that happened uh, before one week. And uh, it was more than 10,000 people marching, like kids, boys, girls, Everybody, everybody, all the city was like marching to the checkpoint. And when we arrived, like the Israeli soldiers was, they prepared themselves. They were there working at a checkpoint for the four days, preparing fence, preparing concrete and lights and snipers. And I, I, many times I go and make uh, photography for the Palestinians throwing stones at the Israeli soldiers, but this one was the first time for me that I really felt afraid. Since the snipers was shooting from 15 to 10 meters distance, and the, 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 they, they were shooting with, without sound. So you suddenly see the boys and the girls and the kids are falling without hearing the sound of the bullet. And it was night, but the, the flashlight was in our face. So we couldn't know what is behind the flashlight. We, we couldn't see. All that you see is the falling bodies of the people and for three hours, there was more than 200 injury with live bullet, live ammunition. And this was break, heartbreaking. You, 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 it, is, it is so hard. You can't do anything. You know, I was just making some photos. And uh, maybe I can show you some of the photos of the pictures. Do, would you like to show us that video that you, that you shot that day? Or, or, yeah, show us pictures too if you want. Yeah, I can show you the pictures. So this was the, the beginning of the demonstration when the people was gathering. And uh, this is the, the green line is the laser from the Israelis. And the Palestinians was uh, using uh, fireworks 
to tower the Israelis. So this is the sniper's line. Everybody in the floor trying to protect their head. Some people watching from distance. These are the people in the front. And this place, if you just like go one meter from this side or from this side, they will be hit by a sniper. Like, and it was live bullet, and they were shooting there most of the, mostly on the knee. They want like kind of a cut the the leg or something. Sorry for this, but what is really interest me this photo. If you see this photo alone, you don't understand where it is. You don't understand if this is a, a, a person who's participating in the demonstration. Like me, myself, he was next to me. I didn't understand until I saw his, his shirt with his uh, logo that he is from the ambulance. When he started helping the injuries, so you understand that he was working there, he was there, he was like, his, his, his whole focus was just like carrying the injuries. So his mission was carrying the injuries. My, my position was, I was making photos. It was, it was kind of a craziness. And uh, I didn't know what I was doing there because I'm not doing art. I'm doing photography, trying documentation. What was my role there? Was it the first time that you, with you yourself, experienced five bullets being used? Is that why you were so like uh, concerned? No, no, it was not the first time. Many times, but the, but I don't know. Like that, that time was something different. That time, because this is the first time that I, I, mean, I see. A, a massive amount of people being falling down without hearing the sound of the bullet. When you hear the sound of the bullet, you you knew that it it is it doesn't hit you. But when you, you don't hear it, you don't know if it hit you or not because sometimes the bullet you don't feel the the pain from the first time. Wow. So when I did this, I did it as a as a way of yani taking my anger out and trying to do something. And uh, since all the journalists is going there to make uh, journalistic photos, like uh, very strong photos for somebody jumping in the air, somebody flying from the bullet, and all these photos, to sell to their uh, comp uh, agencies. And to s so for me, it was just for purpose of showing this and the social medias, Twitter and Facebook, and sending my email to my friends to share it and to tell what was happening there. And uh, you know, I want, I want to, I want to ask you to somehow address what I was trying to address, and I tried to sort of like engage you with with my ideas about about sort of like these double processes of celebrating Palestinian art here in New York and the war that was going on there. What do you what do you think as an artist? Do you do you see any do you see any productive role for what you do? I don't even want you to talk on behalf of other artists, but the kind of practice you have, because obviously your work somehow is oh yeah, this picture is very I, I hope you get a chance to explain this one. Yeah. What, how do you see your work being somehow sort of like Determinate, not so indeterminate, and actually sort of like contributing to the future of Palestine. Uh, for me, when I decided to make my uh, my film that you saw in the museum, uh, I was doing it because I was determined to do it, and uh, I struggled a lot to get the fund to get to make the film. Since when you start to make, it, like when you are going to make the film, the the sponsors, the, sponsors, the people who give the money, they need to put their agenda on the film. 
So they will cancel all your ideas. But I was determined on, 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 on making the film and insisting that I will make the film in the way that I want to make, because I am the one who was there for more than four years and a half filming and living that the, the moment with people. So I, 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 I film for, I have 55 uh, hours of footages, and each second mean something for me. There is a moment in each second, and I remember each moment, I remember each person, because I was living there, I was living with these people. So I decided to make the film with, without any budget till I get the rough cut of the film and then when I had the rough cut, I, I, I succeed to, to have the power to decide my film. Many uh, creators and uh, directors and uh, people who work in this, uh, they want a stereotype image about like, either you have heroes in the film, either you have victims in the film. But for me, I don't see heroes, I don't see victims. I see humans who are trying to do their daily life by going to visit their families, their parents, their, their friends, going to the hospital, going to the school, going to the church, or to the most of the, on the other side of the world. And when I try to explain that, and I explain it very well, and I always tell the journalists that this wall is in the West Bank, this wall separates the people from each other, separate the people in the West Bank from the other part of the West Bank, which is Jerusalem. And then they go and they say it is the border between Palestine and, and Israel. It's not the wall on the Green Line, it's the wall that separates the West Bank. And so, but it, I think it was important for the film as the first time to be in the museum, because it was always in the festivals. And uh, the way that uh, we decided to screen it, the way that we decided to have the installation, uh, it add more to the film since it is 70 minutes, and I decided to show the 70 minutes, not just like 15 or 20 minutes. So I don't want to make a special version for the museum. This is the film. It's 70 minutes. You need to show it as 70 minutes. And the person who would like, they are there, they can decide what to see. So for, if we can go back to that photo. Too bad you didn't come to New York to see the rest of the show, to see how the whole show worked out. But yeah. I, I, thought, I thought your piece was one of the most powerful pieces in the exhibition, actually. Okay. And Miriam has some stuff to say about it. So if you want, we can move on maybe to Miriam. Okay, you want me to read the story of the photo, or it's okay? We're going, to talk to you. We're going to talk to you later when we get to the discussion part. Don't you should sit here. Okay, hi, Miriam. How can I need this stuff? First of all, thank you, Mohammed, for including me in this event. And thank you, everybody at White Box. You've all been absolutely fantastic. Um, I was going to talk about. Thanks. Um, I was going to talk about um, uh, what you mentioned, Mohammed, about there being be, there being no delay in barbary and civilization. Um, and what I was going to talk about was. Uh, first of all, how I met Khaled, uh, which was at the seventh Berlin Biennial, which I think was a pivotal moment in the recent history of art. Then I was going to talk about the satellite show that we had planned, and we had to change its concept, me and Joseph and Red Jones, that we had to cancel because activism could not take place there. I was going to talk about a comment uh, that came to me after that show was cancelled that is also an example of there not being a delay in Barbary and civilization which is Khaled was not allowed to exit but we were not allowed to enter an art space and a friend of mine came back to me and said 
Jean Hillary, who is an amazing artist, and she said to me in French, this is a parcours sans faute, meaning this is, this things here come full circle, um, and there's barbary, and there's a civilization. I was going to talk about uh, uh, the artist and how when we discuss here and elsewhere at the new museum, we tend to talk about the curator or the show or your quote about Daniel Buren, but we fail to mention the artist. And I think that is something that when we look at the art world, we see a structure that is very similar to the structure in the United States um, at large. There is a 1%, and the artist is at the bottom. The artist is the worker. And I think it is all the other people who are who have a chance to lift that worker up in a similar vein as in um, in Israel it is very important to have support from Israelis in Israel whether that is people who are renouncing their citizenship or they are deserting the army or they are voting differently or they are active but they we need that um, feminism needs men and we need um, men not just to say that they are feminists we need them to act upon it I was going to talk about all of that, but now that I've heard Gillette speak, again, I think that the artist's voice is so much more important than here or elsewhere or the new museum or anything. And I just want to quote this piece. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have read it. Uh, Noam Chomsky, two days ago, wrote somewhere, I'm not sure if it was the New York Times, but in a, piece, a part of that says, and this refers back again to that no delay, um, it says, in an interview, human rights lawyer Raji Surani, who has remained in Gaza through years of Israeli brutality and terror, said, the most common sentence I heard when people began to talk about ceasefire, everybody says, it's better for all of us to die and not go back to the situation we used to have before this war. We don't want that again. We have no dignity, no pride. We are just soft targets, and we are very cheap. Either this situation really improves, or it is better just to die. I am talking about intellectuals, academics, ordinary people. Everybody is saying that. This is what that uh, lawyer said, and that's that's all I can say um, at this moment after listening to Khaled. I, I have a hard question to ask you, but we'll, we'll save it for, for, for maybe later. Sure. Uh, Alex, do you wanna do you wanna join us? Are you ready? Uh, sure. Yeah, I can. Uh, whenever you want, uh, I'm happy to speak. Yes, you, 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 go ahead. Should, uh, I, should sure. I give an, should I, uh, Alex Shams is a commentator, he lives in Bethlehem, and he, he works for, he works for a non-profit human rights organization, and his Facebook has been one of the most incredible sources of information, not from Gaza, but just from general sense of how the Gaza uh, situation was unfolding in the West Bank, and also because of him being a well-versed blogger and knowing what's going on, he became the source of news for all of us, and we depended on him to send us sort of like what to read and all the informed pieces from the Israeli side and from the Palestinian side, and acted as some sort of a hub here for us to kind of like get attraction on the situation and I thought it would be great to have him someone from outside of the art world to actually talk about talk about his opinion but also specifically if he also can address the frame that I set for the conversation uh, thanks for that introduction um, just to, to clarify one thing though I actually work for a, an, a news agency an independent Palestinian news agency um, here um, not a human rights organization but um, but thank you for having me, especially like as you said, because uh, I am, I think, one of the few people who's not uh, from the art world taking part in this conversation. Um, now, I want to, I think I just wanted to address two points uh, from the original uh, introduction. Um, the first was about placing Palestine uh, in the contemporary moment um, and how to think about Palestine and how to relate Palestine um, to ongoing developments, not only in the region, but also um, around the world. And then second, to, to come back to this issue of the delay um, between barbarism and civilization that, that keeps coming up. Um, so first off, um, discussing Palestine, I think one thing that I, I just want to uh, point out before 
uh, anything. Because often when we talk about Palestine or discussing Palestine, um, we're not always just discussing Palestine. Um, or we're not, I mean, sometimes we're not even talking about Palestine. Um, and that many of the, you know, Palestine is kind of a laboratory case in many ways for, many, for the technologies of barbarism, uh, barbarism killing, violence. Um, that we see deployed around the world, particularly in the U.S., but also, for example, in um, the many Arabic, uh, Arab dictatorships surrounding Israel that have close relations with Israel, um, as well as in Europe and many other countries. Um, and so when we're looking at kind of security innovations that are taking place in Israel um, and, and the different technologies that are put in place either to regulate human life, to regulate death, um, you know, new and inventive ways to kill people or to punish people with live bullets, uh, as was being mentioned, kind of in the knees in such a way that doesn't create an international controversy but also act actively disables people, um, as well as, let's say, the systems of biometric identification um, that are used to control movement between places, between villages, between houses. Um, is, I mean, these things are all deployed, um, you know, they're not only deployed in the U.S., whether it be on the border or in U.S. prisons, or, for example, during the U.S. occupation of, of Iraq, um, but they're also, uh, so it's not only these intellectual links or, or kind of Palestine reflecting or, um, or sort of feeding back into these, the, these loops of security and technology uh, and life and death, um, but also, I mean, I think there are very direct material links in terms of U.S. funding, uh, for this innovation, for this kind of technological, um, for these technologies of security and of surveillance. Um, and I think, I mean, one of the things with, with Palestine um, that I think is a logic that I, we see around the world but becomes particularly salient when looking at Palestine is um, the issue of submitting to Israeli political and economic logic uh, or death. Um, and this kind of choice that's offered to Palestinians, whether it be in Gaza, which is kind of the death option, um, or the, the West Bank option, which is also a death option, but is a much less spectacular form of death, um, which is Sorry, a one option accompanied by economic penetration. Um, in between submitting to Israeli political and economic logics or uh, death on the other side, basically. Um, and so Gaza, which, let's say, takes the resistance or, or death option, um, you know, it's uh, it's not it's the, you know there are spectacular forms of violence like the one we've seen over the last uh, 30 days, um, but there's also as was mentioned uh, immediately prior uh, to this there's the slow logic of um, slow uh, kind of um, destruction of human life um, as part of this kind of uh, Hamas or, or Gazan refusal to be a part of the Israeli economic and political logics, um, and so you have this eight-year blockade. Um, in which people are put on the diet, to use you know the the the, tech, the, the words that are being deployed by Israeli officials. Um, but at the same time, Gaza remains a captive economic market. So throughout this blockade, even as everything uh, you know the, the massive limitation of imports and exports into Gaza remained in place, you still had trucks coming from Israel uh, bringing Israeli imports into Gaza. And so you had this kind of dependency logic that emerged, where not only was Gaza being punished, it was also being punished by being forced to buy and consume only Israeli goods, um, even if it was on a diet or on a dietary, you know, on a diet level, as uh, Israeli officials were saying. Um, and then this also occurred during, you know, outbreaks of spectacular violence. So in the last two weeks, for example, um, you've had the Israeli army um, mentioning numerous times that whenever there was a ceasefire of some sort, they've allowed trucks of aid in. Um, and, and this kind of, once again, this bizarre, where even the death of Gazans is consumed by this, this logic of, of economic penetration and, and of Israeli, not only generosity, but also Israeli attempts to kind of ensure that capitalism is able to reach the Gazan people, um, even as they're being killed but through the same Israeli logic of, of uh, political and economic logic. Um, and then I think at the same time in the West Bank, what we're seeing um, is that okay? And so the West Bank being the other side of this, right, in which um, th you have uh, submission to Israeli political and economic logics, whether this be the complete penetration um, of kind of the I Israeli neoliberal system and the creation of the West Bank as this completely captive market to Israeli products, um, or you know the the which goes hand in hand with the political submission um, of uh, of Palestinians in the West Bank, and particularly the Palestinian elite, um, and the logic of security cooperation, which goes along with the political, pen uh, the economic penetration, um, which appears to be part of these larger processes of the commodification of the of, of the idea of revolution or of resistance to begin with. 
Um, and what I mean by that is that, uh, I mean, when we look at the Palestinian Authority that now is in charge of, I mean, technically in charge of 20% of the West Bank in the Area A, um, but even that's a very tenuous situation, um, but ma mainly exists to be this kind of uh, economic elite, um, is that they're taking this very reactionary, anti-colonial uh, and anti-Zionist view in which there is the creation of an ethno-national Palestinian state, which is still, um, you know, sub uh, submissive or um, you know actively taking part in the Israeli political and economic logics but but wears for example the clothing of, uh, of kind of an anti-colonial movement and uses the revolution in the same way that like um, I don't know like high school American kids wear a kefia uh, I mean ten five years ago I guess that was kind of the trend um, and and then this kind of the economic uh, and political institutions that are that are behind all of this that are sub actively supporting this the securitization of daily life um, you know the deployment of Palestinian, you know, security forces and secret forces, secret service, sorry, secret services that really only exist to carry out Israeli will. Um, you know, creates this hyper securitization of of Palestinian life in the West Bank that I think um, is almost unprecedented. I mean, in terms of the the, the amount and level of surveillance um, and regulation of human life. Um, but but at the same time, you have these these kind of bizarre moments where. Um, for, for example, for uh, the Nakba Day protests, or I mean numerous times in protests, you have, for example, banks um, that put up large posters calling on people to go out and protest, when at the same time the elites in charge of these banks um, are obviously very much embedded in the same political institutions that are part of the security forces, that then are part of the Israeli kind of uh, uh, way of cracking down on these same protests. Um, and so it's, uh, I mean, and then, you know, the political logic of, of submission is also manifested in very direct ways. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the economic issue being the captive market, the kind of regulation of imports from Jordan or Turkey or any other country, really, um, and the submission of all West Bankers. I mean, to the point that it's hard to have a discussion about BDS in the West Bank because every single product in the market comes from Israel. There's no way around it. Um, and, uh, but then on the, the political aspect, I mean, is that, for example, you have policies that even in the 20% of the West Bank that is controlled by the authority, um, the Palestinian security forces have to withdraw from the streets uh, when the Israeli security forces call them and tell them that they're entering the streets. And so it's this very bizarre um, kind of logic of, of security forces that exist only to suppress dissent, and but even then have to pull back if the Israeli will is, is to suppress dissent more strongly. Um, and like I said, I think, um, I mean, we, there is a hyper-intensity of, of these processes in Palestine, in the West Bank and Gaza specifically. Um, but the, when we look at them, we can also see more broadly how these same policies, the regulation of life and death, um, are being deployed more actively. Um, around the world uh, by the same governments that are, you know, taking part and that are actively part of the kind of research and development um, that, that then is then, you know, tested in the, in the Palestinian laboratory. Um, and the, secondly, I just wanted to address um, kind of going back to the issue of the, the delay that was being brought up or that was being mentioned. Um, and how, I mean, uh, Mohammed was suggesting that there is this kind of um, previously, we had this kind of barbarism and then a delay uh, before the kind of the spoils of war and the civilization were kind of recognized in the captive or um, previously or currently colonized population. But now it seems that there's no delay between the kind of dehumanization and killing and the glorification and celebration. Um, it's happening at the same time that Palestinian artists, are, you know, they, you know, they have more. Um, they're more visible in the American art scene than they've ever been before at the same time as 2,000 people are killed in the span of, you know, three weeks uh, in Gaza. Um, and, but I, I mean, I would suggest that this is not, um, this is not entirely new. Um, and I think, I mean, I think the genealogy, perhaps if we look at it, or if we want to trace it back, we can see some of it, um, you know, in like the 1870s World Fairs and then for many decades after that, in which um, captive uh, or colonized populations around the world were that were kind of brought to European cities, um, and there were kind of you know these fake uh, Senegalese villages or fake Samoan villages, just to name a few of the ones that were done, um, where people from these countries were brought, forced to live, um, you know, in the center of European capital cities as a human zoo. Um, and I mean, at the same time, that if we look in terms of the power dynamics, there is definitely there's there's there is a qualitative difference there. 
Um, and in terms of this kind of, um, I mean, the human zoo aspect and, and the issue of kind of knowing the other in order to assert one's control and superiority over the other and to justify the colonization of the other. Um, but at the same time, I think it's not so, it's not so far off from, from what we're seeing with uh, Palestinian or Arab uh, um, or Middle Eastern artists more broadly, I think, um, though specifically uh, it's, it's uh, hyper-visible with the Palestinian case. Um, and I think, I, th I think one thing that's important that I want to suggest is that um, it can be linked very specifically to the rhetoric of human shields um, that has become, in, you know, I don't know how else to say it, ridiculously popular in the last month. Um, and I think over the last five years specifically, we've really, really seen not only this discourse becoming more prominent, but also becoming more and more, um, you know, widely tolerated. You have ordinary people who can, who when confronted with, you know, thousands of dead people can just bring up the human shields argument. Um, and I think, and this isn't only in the Palestinian case, but I think it also has to do with these kind of metaphors as the only kinds of people we can relate to are those, um, you know, are in some way being held hostage, either by their government or by a political movement or by their religion or by their culture. Um, and so here I'm thinking of, for example, Iranian, Iranian, not only Iranian artists, Iranians more broadly, who are always identified as being, um, like somehow being held hostage by their government. We, we, we were taught that we have to see a government and a people who are separate entities um, and, and the people who are being held hostage. They, you know, they're, they're good people, they're just held, held hostage by a bad government. And, I mean, besides the fact that that binary completely erases the complexities of kind of daily life and engagement with any regime in any country, um, and also this kind of massive simplification wherein the only people we can, we can relate to are those who are opposed to the governments or movements or religions or cultures that we, you know, dislike or identify as the enemy, um, it also, I think it, it also relates to this, this whole rhetoric of human shields of people being held hostage. Um, and, and what we saw before... Or, I mean, this existed previously, I think specifically with, let's say, the, the right to protect doctrine, in which case the Iraqi people were great, but they were being held hostage by an evil government. We have to kill Saddam, and if, you know, there's collateral damage, that's, that's sad, but it's a fact of life, and we're going to liberate them regardless. Um, in which there was this pretense of liberalism. It was a disgusting pretense of liberalism. It was, a, it was an obvious um, facade. But it's, it's been interesting to see that facade collapse with the new discourse around human shields and, and this kind of hostages, because not only now are we, or let, I mean, is Israel able to say there's a difference between the people in Gaza and their government, which is straight out of, you know, the, the Iraq war playbook, um, but they're also able to say that even though we recognize, uh, and I'm not saying this is the case, but within the same logic of, of hostage taking that they're using, that even though the people in Gaza are being held hostage by their government, we can still kill them. And I mean, it, it's the most bizarre um, logic that, I've, that, that I can think of because um, you have basically Israel pushing this new, this, uh, this new rhetoric which is being widely accepted and widely tolerated. I mean, it's only when we get to, you know, some symbolic number like 1,500 or when they literally bomb 10 children in a row that, that we're kind of confronted with the fact that uh, maybe there's something going wrong. Um, uh, but that if someone is taken hostage and we recognize they have no agency in the situation, it's completely legitimate to kill them. Um, and I think it's, this is kind of the first time that I can think of really that we're really seeing that deployed as an actual argument um, and there's something just more sinister and more brazen about it than the, than the right to protect doctrine. I mean, some people might say it's better. It's, it's an acknowledgement of what right to protect was explicit or was implicitly or was implying. Um, but it is... I, I don't know. I think w when I'm thinking about what we're talking about, this, this, the end of the delay between dehumanization and glorification, and the fact that only, let's say, those artists who, you know, whether it be are state their opposition to Hamas or make some or are forced to make some kind of statement saying I'm against human shields or rockets, then that's kind of like when the door opens to them to be allowed in, because because by coming to know that artist or by coming to know that person's work, we then understand Palestinians as a people that are hostage, are being held hostage by their government, and that in turn makes it more legitimate for us to kill um, both the members of that government, or in this case Hamas, or anyone who happens to be around Hamas. Um, and so th it almost seems that there's this feedback loop between the division of the good Palestinian and the bad Palestinian that then becomes part and parcel of the rhetoric of slaughtering Palestinians uh, who don't have, let's say, access to um, those same spaces or, um, or you know, 
able to go to New York or whatever. Um, I think that's all the comments I wanted to make at the moment. But um, well, yeah. you know, we 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 we've been having a little bit of difficulty with the sound because something happened to the speaker system here is a little bit like different than what we tested yesterday. But we still can understand you. Know, I just I just appreciate if other people who are online can speak a little bit slower to make it make it a little bit easier for people to sort of like engage. So I don't know who would like to do. Who would like to go next? We also have another guest, another guest joining us from online. So, uh, George, do you would you like to speak? Hello, George. George is the director of MA program in film studies at the, at the College of Fine Arts from Chicago. And he's been kind of following the development in Gaza and providing all sorts of like um, a critical voice online. And we've been following him on Facebook and his posts. So and he was like um, was like a, asked to kind of like join us and be one of the respondents. I don't know, you can join now or you can join later. But like uh, I don't know who how is the feel? It's just like it's just like. Uh, should we actually, we, George? I'm a little bit like confused here because of the sound problem. Why don't we Why don't we take take another person from here and then we go to you? Sorry, and sorry to Tony for confusing you. How about um, do you, do you want to go, Joseph? Sure. Okay, you go. Can I access the internet? Um, no, you can access the internet on my uh, on the iPad. Why don't you do that? And what stream? Tony. What stream? Oh, um, you want to put something up? Yeah. Oh, I see. So yeah, let's just open a window and go ahead. Um, thanks, Mohammed, for uh, including me in the conversation. And thank you to White Fox for uh, giving us this venue to discuss Palestine. Um, Should I give an introduction about you? Sure. OK, I'll do that. Joseph is an artist and also a curator. His work combines science, culture, and technology to explore the physical and political landscape of the Middle East. So here we go. Joseph, go ahead. Um, I guess I kind of want to take a step back from a lot of the violence that's happening in Gaza, for example. Um, recently, some, as some of you all know, Shijaya, a neighborhood um, east of Gaza City, uh, near the Israeli border, was um, most of the neighborhood was decimated, um, and it's actually a very old neighborhood in Gaza that has a lot of historical landmarks, sort of uh, um, monuments of cultural heritage. Um, it has it has a couple mosques, one that dates back to the 14th century. Uh, called Ibn Uthman, another one uh, that dates back to the 15th century, and Shuja is named after um, an Ayyubid commander under the Crusades. His name is uh, Shuja al-Din Uthman al-Kurdi, so I think that means he, his origin is Kurdish. Um, but I think in a lot of these uh, discussions about war and conflict, um, some of the points that are very powerful uh, tend to focus on when the destruct when cultural landmarks or um, UNESCO World Heritage sites, for example, are destroyed, um, and and trying to relate it to other situations because I think the destruction of Palestinian homes or, or people um, by Israel isn't really unique. Um, you know, during Operation Protective Edge, uh, ISIL or the Islamic State. Uh, for Iraq and the Levant actually destroyed a tomb of the prophet Jonah. Um, depending on how you look at it, he's also one of the grandchildren of the second caliph, Omar bin al-Khattab, uh, outside of Mosul in Iraq, um, which happened on July 24th, uh, 2014, this year. Um, and so it's considered sacred by a lot of Sunni Muslims, but also Shiite Muslims and non-Muslims Christians. Um, and I think it's it speaks to the Salafi principle of trying to uh, purify the earth from um, polytheism, and so these religious shrines or sacred sites uh, that are devoted to a single person 
um, are oftentimes considered kind of sanctifying uh, worshiping of multiple gods. Um, and to bring it back to a philosopher that Muhammad mentioned, uh, Bruno Latour, uh, in an article he wrote called like, Iconoclast, he talks about these sacred icons that have been sort of celebrated in worship. Um, they're not necessarily made by any human uh, hand, per se, um, and he calls them akedopoete. Um, and so the tomb of Prophet uh, Jonah in Mosul uh, seems like a prominent example. Um, this is sort of a before image, um, I think pre-July 24th, and it seems like kids mm -hmm. kind of sorting through the rubble just a couple weeks later. That's again in Mosul, right? And that's outside of Mosul in Iraq, yeah. Uh, and it was destroyed during Operation Protective Edge, mm -hmm. uh, which was taking place in Palestine against Gaza. Um, <laughs> Another, another example that he mentions uh, is actually the destruction of uh, the Bamiyan Buddhas uh, in Afghanistan, which were destroyed by the Taliban, I think, in March 2001. Um, so they're carved into the Bamiyan Cliffs in the Hindu Kush Mountains. There are two giant niches um, of a Buddha. One stands 50, or one stood 50 meters tall, the other uh, 40 meters tall. Um, and it, it's sort of become uh, a strategy by kind of extremist political groups to target these sort of sacred icons and monuments. Um, and so something I've been exploring recently uh, in my own work um, is a pair of uh, Palestinian incense burners. Um, from Tel Janin, uh, an archaeological settlement in the north of Palestine. Um, and this is a clay horseshoe shaped um, incense burner that dates back to the 8th century. Um, and it was excavated by the Department of Israeli Antiquities um, in 1962 along with an Umayyad uh, steatite pot. Um, and a lot of these archaeological digs by Israel. Um, some of the most famous ones took place in the 1960s, uh, places like Masaba in the Negev Desert. Um, a lot of them are kind of... <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, that, yeah, I think this is a little people online don't know what we're laughing at. We we're, we're actually have another window open. We're looking at some Google images right now that you guys don't have access to because we're not screen sharing, which actually you can you can do if you want, but I don't know if you, if you want to do that. Let's sure. just maybe Let's... maybe do the screen sharing as well. That was the window, right? Mm -hmm. Screen two, sorry. Screen two, right? It's Google, so I think it's that one. No, that's that's another screen. I'm sorry. There we go. Maybe it is going to. Let's see if it is. Oh my god, <laughs> now it's like. <laughs> anyway, I'll just try to be. Yeah, as never as mind. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really cool effect, so we all learn something. Anyway, yeah. Um, Basically, it's an, it's an old fortress uh, in the south of Israel, and it's near the Negev Desert, and it was also um, excavated as part of a series of digs that took place in the 1960s that were uh, supported financially and logistically by Israeli Defense Forces. Um, and so I've been 
been looking at these pair of incense burners, asking why a pair of cultural artifacts have become sort of an issue of uh, of national defense um, and access to them. They're they're located in the storeroom in the Department of Israeli Antiquities in Jerusalem. So, as an artist. Uh, with the West Bank idea, I don't necessarily have access to uh, look at them directly, uh, but part part of what I'm trying to do is um, look at the the history and culture of thurification, which is the process of burning incense for sort of social, magical, and religious purposes, um, and using the very same technology, 3D imaging, computer animated design, which is used by museums to uh, a lot of times preserve these old artifacts um, and in turn trying to think of uh, how we could sort of update uh, this old process, process of incense burning uh, using kind of new tools, science and technology. Um, and I guess, yeah, my own access or inaccess as a Palestinian artist to um, the, these original artifacts kind of shapes my own process. Um, and I have some questions for you, but I guess I can I can wait for the sure. for everyone to sort of present, and then we can we can we can question. Um. Are you are you are you done, Joseph? Yes. Could you raise your voices, please? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So next we have Judy Rudenbeck, who is an art historian and a critic based in New York and Los Angeles, a past editor of Art Journal. She's also author of Radical Prototypes, Alan Capro, and the Invention of Happenings. Her essay on Akram Zatari's missives is forthcoming this fall. Also, I asked Judith to be part of the panel because she was one of the one of the rare voices in the art world who was really vocal about what was going on in Gaza. And uh, a lot, of, a lot of, a lot of real art world people try to not really address it and not take it on because it's a controversial issue and it's sort of like. They didn't really want to like address it, and then it was like a bunch of us who tried to sort of like not sensationalize it again, but really try to like post stuff that like gave a depth to what was happening and connected it to other stuff. And I thought Judy would be a great addition to our talk. And she just happened to be in New York on her way to LA. Did you get off your points? Getting a chance, yeah. Yeah. So we are lucky to have Judy with us. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. They're seeing you, so you don't have to worry. Yeah. But it's quite a weird experience, actually, to have this screen and all these people facing in the other direction. But, <laughs> um, I'll be very brief. Um, since I'm speaking from a place of, I would say, ethical concern rather than deep knowledge. Um, but I wanted to make a few sets of remarks. The first about one of the questions that you raised, Mohammed, um, which has to do with the place of art in, um, in confronting these kinds of uh, geopolitical calamities. Uh, and the question of, of whether it has any um, effective use at all uh, as a practice. Uh, so I want to start by saying we're, we're uh, holding this discussion in the context of uh, an exhibition um, that takes as its title uh, the title of a film by Jean-Luc Godard that um, deals with relations um, between Palestine and uh, basically uh, France um, uh, at a crucial moment in the history of the, the PLO as it's falling apart. So it, embedded in the, the very framing of this exhibition is, 
is the set of problems that, uh, that are under discussion here. Uh, although that is less acknowledged in the apparatus surrounding the exhibition. So I, I want to flag that and note um, uh, embedded in other parts of that apparatus, namely the catalog, one little footnote, which is um, the refusal of the Palestinian artist Ahlam Shibli uh, to participate in a show framed as new art from uh, the Arab Middle East, um, and her refusal to thereby be categorized uh, and in fact contained um, uh, by that geographical and presumably political uh, marker. So there's, there's an absence, there's a set of absences at the core of this exhibition that I would say more broadly are absences um, that have been uh, glaring in uh, uh, discourse in the United States, uh, certainly mainstream discourse, for many years. And this is the first time in my lifetime um, that I've heard people uh, in the United States, Americans, um, uh, talking about a place called Palestine, uh, openly. Um, so I want to acknowledge that. Um, that place uh, may have a physicality. It's a fractured um, physicality. Uh, it has a spirit. But it is uh, basically a kind of imagined, uh, imagined formation. So I want to I want to put that out there and say that contemporary art uh, itself is a fractured, atomized thing. There is no such thing as contemporary art, a, a single unified uh, category of stuff. Um, so that at the same time we have this show uh, at the New Museum, we have. Um, this crazy Jeff Koons retrospective at the Whitney. Put those two things next to one another and call them both contemporary art just doesn't make sense uh, at all. So I like to think of uh, uh, contemporary art, that category, as having to do uh, primarily with the market, uh, uh, with marketing and with a kind of um, uh, entertain a set of entertainments uh, like those you can uh, experience uptown. And then there's something else um, uh, that happens that slithers out of that category that is a different kind of uh, cultural practice, artistic practice, a different kind of contemporary art, if you will. Um, and that is a kind of practice that rather than oh, yeah, uh, 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 professing the aesthetic professes the anti-aesthetic. That is not all about uh, a sort of feeling good and uh, you know the, the, the soft skin of uh, visual pleasure, um, but something else, uh, which is information, the capacity to deliver information, the capacity to deliver to the imagination other possible uh, possible futures, and in the most uh, uh, I think exciting of the projects in uh, the exhibition at the New Museum, that imagination is present, both as a, a potential positive, there will be a future, um, and uh, in a kind of necessary negativity. This is what it might look like. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I also like to think of that type of practice um, as upholding, it's not very popular to say right now uh, that art is a sort of autonomous sphere of activity, but upholding kind of tactical autonomy. Um, that's a tactical autonomy that allows us to have precisely this kind of conversation. Um, uh, in, uh, in this kind of space, uh, to live interstitially uh, uh, in a way. Um, there's a, uh, a last, uh, I'll make two other, two more remarks uh, uh, around that. So this, there's a tactical autonomy um, and a necessary negativity uh, 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 to uh, this kind of critical practice that is contemporary art but it's not contemporary art, the market, uh, the market category. I think that's why we see so many of these works um, making use of indexical devices. Uh, that is photography, video, fil you know, fil film, meaning the sort of plastic pellicule, uh, uh, devices of, uh, of witnessing. And I was very struck by Khaled's um, repeated mention of the absence of the sound of bullets. Right, the absence of the sound of bullets, so that indexing of, uh, of the ballistic as a kind of reconfiguration of the sensorium 
under duress. Um, uh, I wanted also then to, um, to, to broaden out and um, think about that reconfiguration of the sensorium and the kind of slave mentality that it's uh, installed in us. Uh, where here, uh, rather than elsewhere, we get our news um, via uh, uh, infotainment, uh, news via infotainment, or what you might call entermation, uh, you know, of John Stewart or Stephen Colbert, where comedy redefines itself to be the one place that actually delivers uh, a, a kind of reality check uh, in the media, the media sphere. Um, I wanted to drop in. Uh, one little remark, four little words that emerged a few days ago. Uh, we tortured some folks. We tortured some folks. Um, uh, and, and just to point to the, the kind of rhetoric being deployed there, right, uh, where folks uh, means uh, trivial people, as I pointed out elsewhere. Uh, maybe, maybe our president has to use the word folks to talk about people because corporations are people. Uh, so human beings must be something else. Uh, they're, they're folks. We tortured some folks uh, is, to, is to diminish the value of those folks right? um, uh, into uh, some kind of kitschy uh, uh, garden gnome uh, type creature. Right? The kitschification, um, the in fact um, de depersonalization uh, of, those, of those people. Um, so civilization and barbarism and the lack of delay, those things uh, all arrived together. Um, the last thing I want to say is we, we tortured some folks um, is a, a kind of remark, uh, leaving aside the practice temporarily. It's the kind of, the, of remark that puts into play the sort of game theoretical logic uh, under which we now live. Right? So the, the rhetoric of human shields in which somehow uh, uh, the people of Gaza are responsible for their own murder um, because somehow a plurality of them voted for uh, this organization called Hamas to uh, lead them. They're complicit in their own murder by uh, Israeli troops. That's a game theoretical uh, rhetorical gesture being deployed. We are being gained uh, uh, by language, and as we're being gained by language, uh, people are people are dying. I'll stop there. Thank you. So, without without a double introduction, maybe we can go straight to George. Okay. Your, your, your microphone, sound? yeah, your sound will come on. You, you mean me? Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm actually Louis George, and people call me Louis Schwartz. I live in Ohio, not Chicago. Um, I, uh, I'll, I'll be brief as well, like Judith. Thank you, Mo, for um, inviting me to this, and I've, I've learned a lot from each of these um, presentations. Uh, this is a, a, a kind of response to or, or an interest in uh, something that Alex said when he concluded, which is um, about the way in which the simultaneous um, celebration and destruction um, of a people um, corresponds with um, the logic of the actual, with, with actual, actual Zionist logics that are enforced on Palestinian life. Um, as a, I became interested in the course of studying film, in what Marx called surplus populations, that is to say populations that have been driven off land or some kind of sustenance farming arrangement over a long period of time, um, used as a reserve labor pool for a while, and then they um, aren't useful as a reserve labor pool to, to, to capital um, anymore. And I've come to think that there's a particular kind of racism or developments within racism, be the racist ideology that kind of makes this psychologically possible that's specific to that process and specific to that process um, in our time by which a certain kind of social objection follows the economic objection of the people or of a people such as the Palestinians um, so that they can appear at the moment when they're completely de trop, completely extra to the economic system as sacrificable 
And the difference between the World's Fair pseudo-ethnographic exhibitions that um, Alex was mentioned earlier um, in what he, we had to say and what's going on with, um, with, EC, with here and elsewhere um, and the images that we see now is that the images of destruction weren't seen until much later than the World's Fair and, uh, and, the, um, and the ethnographic displays. Um, and so on. And now we really see these images at the same time, which to me is, is, a, is even in the secular world, is a logic of religious sacrifice, right, that's been made possible by the complete economic and social abjection of the population. So that this moment where there's, there's a show in New York like um, here and elsewhere, and um, so I only got to see certain images from that through web sources, but people can see that and at the same time be hooked into this network of images that kind of no particular image is understandable without reference to a kind of target scope image released or that could be released by the Zionist government. There's this logic of look at the beauty of these people and watch them die at the same time, that's absolutely a very kind of, I mean, it's, it's the kind of logic of sacrifice that people in France were writing about. Um, in the it's French anthropologists were writing about in the in the 30s, and it's quite striking to me that there's a kind of there seems to be a kind of systematic development of both the racist ideology of sacrifice um, and the the kind of prolonged consequences of economic abjection, by which I mean also to include the repeated destruction of um, infrastructure during a siege, as Alex pointed out, that hooks into a specific economic logic. So. Um, so that's that's my response. Yeah. We, we're kind of done with the with the actual presenters, and because of what you brought up, I actually had a point to make, and I hope that this does not be that that this is not taken the wrong way. But can we explain the sort of like the surge of identification with Palestinian during crisis moments like this among civilized so-called Western people? And then the immediate drop of any kind of like practical long-term concern for them, the minute this sacrifice is over until the next round. And you see like not much sort of like logical, systematized effort to alleviate their pain politically or economically happening in between. And it's only in these moments of human sacrifice that like billions of people in the Western world become kind of all of a sudden passionately interested in the cause of Palestinian only to be forgotten right after the ceasefire. So do you think that has something to do with it? And how can this be kind of bridged? And how can this sort of like energy be directed towards something that's more constructive and more prolonged? Well, um, for contingent reasons, I've been following this situation fairly closely in Palestine for 37 years. We know. Right, but I mean, but so what I want to say is that's exactly the, I don't want to say spectatorial, but that's exactly the, the, the U.S. reception of these moments of, of brutality and, and butchery. Um, you're describing it exactly correctly, right? This is, and, and that's what kind of drove me to the model that I have was noticing noticing everybody get kind of invest in in the act of sacrifice right here um, in the states and being um, it, you know I mean it, it's 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 sickening to 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 kind of be a part of that and to watch one's peers um, drop the whole thing once 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 the masses death ends for a second once the visible once it becomes invisible. Um, for a second, and as to how to treat it, um, I'm not a good person to ask because I'm very pessimistic. Okay, so I want to go back to Miriam, if Miriam doesn't mind. And what I want to what I want to propose is like, you know, in a previous conference I organized. Uh, few months ago in Vancouver called Incredible Machines. This question came up because the critique of contemporary art that is sort of like offered by thinkers like Sohail Malik and I kind of like, I go for like, I endorse 
so he has outline of what is wrong with contemporary art, which actually is part of our facing the future platform. This problem in determinacy, which is, means like anything goes. Art world celebrates all forms of practices and all forms of aesthetics, and because everything is art, then nothing is art. So this this problem in, in determinacy, and then and then, but but also so his refusal to set an example or say what artists or what or what is what is like what is specifically wrong. And then this conversation that, that Sohail got into with the respondent, which is uh, our, our, our common friend, who is actually a critic of New York Times, uh, Martha. And Martha basically had some sort of response, like you. Martha was like, but what about individual artists? What about, this, the, what about the artists themselves? And what about, and then Reza Negarestani, who was there quickly, and this is kind of like a, like a, like a joke, is a, is a bad taste joke for the small one we are. And he said, he turned to Martha and he said something like, uh, I mean, Martha was on, on Google Hangout again, and he was like, oh, this is a human shield, this is a human, you're making a human shield out of the artist. We, we're trying to, like, critique art world, and then you put the figure of the artist in front of it, and then we can't critique it anymore because nobody wants to shoot the artist. So don't you think, by, by sort of, like, changing the, because we all, like, because how I, how I broke it down is, like, actually a lot of art in the show is, is, Pretty spectacular and amazing, mm -hmm. but what happens is like show in total ends up ends up being being indeterminate again. Mm -hmm. So you know what I mean. And then you're saying like, yeah. what about the artists? Like, it's like, mm -hmm. how can we kind of bridge that? How can we sort of like? Uh... The first two things. Um, I think that you're underestimating the artists when you say you put them forward and 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 you put them in the in the front line. I think artists are well, very we're the well curators. capable. You, 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 you put the artists there. Yeah, but they're very capable of being there. I think they're capable of being there, and I think it is a role of a curator to actually take a step back and to say, I trust the artists that I work with, and I, I, I provide a space and I provide funds, which is hugely important, for the artist, and then I, take a few, then I have to take a step back because it's not about me. It's not about the space. It's not about the museum. It's not about... Um, uh, this entire show, but it is about the artist and the voice of the artist. Um, but but don't you think you're making an example out of yourself who actually stands kind of outside of the mainstream of contemporary art to the point that your 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 artist of choice is get barred from traveling and your show end up getting canceled? So maybe maybe like you maybe you're the exception to what we're talking about. And can maybe. your exception kind of like then then make a general case for the rule? So you you're, you're a curator with a voice. And you're a curator who, 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 who does discriminate and say, this art is doing something. I'm going to work with this artist or, or promote this type of art. And I'm going to not work with that type of art because it does, it's not doing what I'm intended to do. Right. But that's, that's, that's exactly what, quote, unquote, contemporary art doesn't do. And that's the